Hello and happy Sunday. Welcome to another episode of Better Combo. I am your host, Nadia Ike, and we are excited that you're here with us today in this moment, at this hour. We have another amazing episode lined up for you. But before we get into it, I just want to check in with you guys and see how you're coming along with your New Year's resolution. Personally, I'm not one to set those type of goals, but I would love to hear from you and hear what some of your goals are. And as you know, our goal here really with Better Combo is to give athletes the opportunity and the platform to share their story and really brand themselves as more than just a sport. On today's episode, we are thrilled to be joined here by Ivorian Sprint's sensation, Wilfred Kofi here. Wilfred, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Hi, hi, Nadia. Hi, how are you doing today? I'm doing good, pretty good. And you? Okay. On side? I, I'm doing amazing. But before we dive into your session, though, I do have to ask you, do you have a New Year's resolution? Oh, mine is uh, it's like more toward to the Iran team. We, I wish that we will do the 4 by one relay in the Olympics. So we are working really hard on that to get this uh, qualification done. So I hope that we could make like the uh, Olympics 4 by one and then join the final. Yeah. Okay. All right. So we at Athletics Africa, of course, are always supporting you guys. And we're excited for that resolution to happen. But before we dive into your session, for those that don't really know you um, or aren't familiar with, you know, Athletics Africa, why don't you just give us a little bit of a background and who you are, your athletic journey, you know, what you're doing now, where you are? Oh, uh, uh, my my name is Wilfried Kofi from the Ivory Coast, one and two hundred meters runner, and then um, I, I'm a former African champion and also world uh, university game champion. And uh, yeah, I've, I've, I've been running with the team uh, since, uh, 2000, since uh, 2008. So, and then I'm still running with uh, uh, the team. Yeah, I think uh, that's it about me. And so, and so why are you training right now? Uh, right now I'm uh, training in uh, Germany. Okay. Right now, so yeah. Okay. And what has that been like with the whole pandemic and everything? Oh, it has been crazy. It's like uh, everybody, like we try as uh, the lockdown is back again. So we try to find a place where to train. And sometimes we are training like uh, outside. Uh, you know, right now there's a winter. So it's pretty hard to be outside and then train because like all the industries are now closed. So it's difficult situation, really difficult condition. And then uh, there are so many rules, so many restrictions. So it's pretty hard to train. It's pretty hard. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure, I mean, much like most track athletes around the world, I think we're all experiencing this and, you know, figuring out how to adapt and how to adjust to this, you know, new normal, so to speak. But for you, when you think about, you know, your goals that you have for this year, um, which I would love to hear about, when you think about those goals, how has you know this whole pandemic situation affected your confidence in achieving those goals? I can lie, like last year in 2019, it was pretty hard that I didn't it's like because you try to start training and then to say like yeah, you are you are ready to do the season, and then you hear that from different government that we are obliged to go to the uh, lockdown again and then everything. Uh, everything get close, so it was like pretty difficult last year even for me to do even one uh, competition that I, uh, I I didn't even do even uh, a competition. So I hope that this year will be better, as the the pandemic the situation is not getting better, mm -hmm. but we hope that it will be better and then uh, there will be the uh, the Olympics we could train. I wish like. All best to all athletes that could get like a place where they can train and then to be ready for those for those competitions for the 2021. Right. And so, what are what are some of the goals that you have for for 2021? Yeah, as I said, 2021 is like to uh, make the team to go back again to the to uh, to the Olympics to Tokyo 2021 and be with uh, my team for the four by one relay. Okay. And do you have any competitions that you have planned or what's the plan for that? 
Uh, right now, I haven't played any indoor competition, like knowing because the stadium are closed, as, as you know. So I haven't done any speed work, like uh, just a little bit of gym, and then so on, like it's kind of pretty, it's kind of pretty slow right now. So we are just waiting and hoping that maybe in February and March that we could get into the stadium and then train. Right, right. And I mean, the the thing about it is it's luckily for athletes around the world, we're all going through that, right? And so you're not the only person that doesn't have competition. So I would say, you know, for the people that are competing against you, they're also in that same, you know, situation where there's a lack of competition, there's lack of uh, accessibility to training and everything like that. So we're all figuring this out together. We're all in this together and, you know, rooting for each other, I think, more than anything. But outside of, you know, just the training, how has your daily routine, I guess, changed with, you know, with this whole pandemic lockdown situation? You know, I'm sure you have other things that you're doing that ha this has really affected. Um, so can you talk through that a little bit? Yeah, it's like, um, I can say pretty much that because uh, apart from running, I'm uh, I'm uh, I'm uh, working, and then I'm uh, currently also doing my uh, PhD degree. I was supposed to go back to China to, because I'm I'm uh, doing the uh, PhD in uh, China, in okay. Shanghai University, and I was supposed to go back uh, last year in January, February, and I couldn't make it because of the uh, pandemic. So now they 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 offer us like a window to do it online but it's kind of pretty complicated so you have to wait for your turn because they're not willing to do like the defense online for a phd uh, degree. That's why we are just waiting and then my thesis is still uh, with my uh, supervisor for uh correction so i'm uh, still waiting so i'm still waiting yeah. okay okay and in terms of funding are you paying for that phd yourself how is it where is the yeah, support in terms of funding like thank god i got a scholarship Okay. I, I I started out doing my uh, master's degree, so I get like if I can say good grades, and then uh, the school for me uh, a PhD uh, uh, a scholarship to uh, continue my uh, PhD degree in uh, finance. So on that side, it's okay, it's fine. Yeah, I don't have don't have any problem with that. But if you can say on training, like because you still have to fund your uh, training, and then. Uh, because right now I I don't have a contract with uh, uh, any brand, so we need to fund by uh, yourself. So which is a little bit tough. Right, and and what are um what are the what are some of the ways that you're funding your training? You said you're working um you're working yeah, on this my way. yeah this is my way because like I had I I I got a master degree, so I start working after London 2017 after the world change. Mm -hmm. So I was like, because for me, it's like in my head, I was like, I got to do something. I, I got uh, I, I got to use my uh, degree and then like uh, start to work. And so I got that offer a year and then uh, I'm, I'm working as, a, as a, uh, an investment manager okay. here in uh, Sane Group, which is the... Uh, like uh, Elias, which is a Luxembourgish company, but we are we are working for the big group called Sane Sane Group, which is based in uh, London, like in uh, Jersey, England. Okay, okay. So, so for the second half of the of the show, we are going to dive in a little bit more about your PhD and and the work that you're doing outside. Uh, but before we get to that, let's take it back to the track a little bit. How yeah. are you balancing working? I'm assuming your job is full time, correct? I can say it's it's uh, pretty hard. It's pretty hard. Like in the beginning, the first year it was 2018. Yeah, it was pretty tough. Because 2018, I went to uh, Birmingham for the Indoor World Championship. Then I started working in uh, April 2018. Like because I I had a break. I talked to my boss. I said, Yeah, you know what? I said you need to go to to uh, Birmingham. My country needs me. So the guy. I understood he's a pretty cool person and then he was like okay so you can go and then please come back and find out that you have a job working for you here so i went there then i got back here but you know i just started progressing the job getting new position getting higher getting tougher and tougher and then it's like uh, it's not easy it's pretty hard and then i'm happy that here the, the the infrastructure are pretty good even if you finish working like at 
maybe 6 p.m., 5.30, you can go back and then you still have the light in the stadium, you know, so you can sit work again night time. So it's like not easy. Sometimes I do gym maybe at 5 a.m. before going to work. Then I go to work and I have to come back and then go to, to run again uh, during the night. So it's it's uh, pretty hard. It's pretty hard. That's, yeah. uh, that's why in the beginning when I told you, I say I focus more on my goal of this year to be in the 4 by one. Mm. That because I'm going to focus here and uh, in in uh, individual race. Yeah. Right, right, and 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 the I guess the unfortunate reality for a lot of athletes who have a career outside of the sport is that sometimes we all oh, not sometimes we have to just sacrifice performance a lot of the time so that we can achieve other things outside of the sport. And so, yeah. I mean, it's credible that your focus has shifted to, you know, really empowering the four by one team and making sure that you guys are succeeding. But I mean, for somebody that's doing your PhD, you're working a full-time job in finance and you're training. It's it's a lot, a lot on your plate. And so I'm my, I guess my next question is when you do get back to doing your PhD, how is this going to balance all out? Do you see yourself still pursuing the sport after um, the Olympics? Are you still going to be competing or are you going to just focus on your career and, you know, PhD? Um, yeah, I think I've been done. Uh, I did uh, a lot, like 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 in the track and field, like in Africa, in uh, the world. So I think like in my uh, position, I think after 2021, 20, it would be like the uh, decision to uh, choose. Because, okay. you know, it's like getting back. My job is pretty interesting as well. I like my uh, job as uh, track and field. But at some point, you need to uh, choose. So that's why I haven't. And I'm not done with the PhD yet, so I can still balance with that. I can still say, like, even if it's at uh, at uh, at work, saying that I need like to do some time for my PhD or for uh, the they will still uh, open it. But we won't continue like that. So at some point, I need to choose. So because this year is like, because uh, this year it's the uh, Olympic year, so I'm still doing it. So we will uh, for, for like 2022. Yeah. So then after so then after 2021 we will we'll see whether or not you're still going to be yeah. fully active on the track. Um, yeah. and then and then another question that I have in terms of you know support in the sport. I mean, I think African athletes more than any other continent, we're supported less by brands. Yeah. Um, I know a lot of people that, you know, you may even have a better performance than um, who may be in Europe or somewhere else and they have a contract, right? Yeah. And you don't have a contract. So talk us a little bit through some of your experience that you've had with having a contract and without having a contract for those of us that aren't as familiar with that. I think Athletics Africa need the whole session to talk about this story. <laughs> because it's big. Like, we need, like, I can say, like, the head of Athletics Africa need to open, like, a huge session for so like five African athletes like to start to talk about because this one is uh, this, is the, this 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 is the hot topic. It you know? is. It's, it's, like, is. Like, it's like it's like uh, it's like in Africa it's it's really difficult. Like you see there are some countries in uh, Africa they could get like the uh, contract and then it's not because they they are they are better than the others. No no it's mm -hmm. all about, sometimes all about organization and like is the way is like the value that you give to yourself is the same way like people will uh, buy you, you know. Mm -hmm. So it's like sometimes we go and those contract and I'm feeling it's like because African we are so many we made athletics in in uh, the world. If you remove the African cont uh, continent in the uh, athletics, there is no athletics anymore. Yeah. So yeah. we have to give ourselves value like. I'm just talking to the head of World Federation and head of uh, Athletic uh, Africa to help those Africans because we are that that that, uh, that many. You went to uh, school, you uh, got a degree. I went to school, I got a degree, but we are not that many. Maybe what we are twenty percent. Yeah. So you know those people who didn't go to school, they, they are going to sign this kind of contract. You know, we don't even know what they are signing. Right. 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 You know? Exactly. So, you know, we need like that. That's why I say we need the whole session to talk <laughs> about it because there are so many things that we need to yes. discuss. about. like you know, it's, like, it's a really, really hot topic. Yes, 
Yes, absolutely. And I 100% agree. I think one part of the problem is, like you said, the organization of it, right? And I think that, yeah. you know, there really isn't an involvement with, you know, from the country level, there really isn't an involvement and regulation of the country in terms of contracts and making sure that the athlete's well-being is, is you know, front and center. And so yeah. I think for at least African athletes that do end up getting contracts, a lot of us are getting taken advantage of. That's one part of the issue. And then another part of the issue is that, you know, being African, being black in the world, makes you a second class citizen. Unfortunately, that's the truth, right? And so even if you're amazing at anything that you're doing, just the fact that you're a black person, the standards are different for you. And then when you're from a country that's predominantly black, the standards are set different. It's almost as if like the bar is continuously shift to be higher and higher to gain recognition or whatever it is. Because there are some people that, you know, are African champions to me that, you know, on a global scale, they're a big deal, right? Mm -hmm. For example, with Fabrice breaking the world indoor world record for a triple jump, no one's talking about it. No, it's coming. I think like, it's just yesterday. It was no, like no, yesterday. No, 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 but you, no it's, it's coming, it's coming. Yeah. But, but I just think that, you know, I, it's just coming from a predominantly black country. A lot of the times the odds are against us too. But uh, also don't forget that we don't own the uh, media. We don't own the media, so that well, Africa, you know, we don't own the media. So even you, Nadia, you you, you do that a triple jump, like you jump like 16 meters, it won't come up like uh, this one. So just, <laughs> it's true. We don't own the media. So part of it is also we don't own the narrative. We don't have the power yeah. to tell our story, which I think in 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 athletics, Africa in our defense here, we're doing that. We're trying to reshape the narrative. We're trying to get the story across and, you know, get people to know about Africa yeah. in a different, in a different scope. But we're going to take a quick break. And when we get back, we're going to dive a little bit more into the other things that you're working on, your PhD, your career, and, you know, some of your goals beyond the sport. So we'll take a quick break and we'll be right back. Okay. okay. Hello and welcome back to Beta Combo. If you're just joining us, we are here with Wilfred Kofi, who is an Ivorian sprinter. And prior to the break, we were just talking to Wilfred about his experience as an athlete, as an African athlete, and some of his goals. So, Wilfred, are you still there? Yeah, yeah. Hi, Nadia. Hi again. <laughs> So, yeah, so as we were talking about, you know, before the break, we kind of started talking a little bit about your career outside of the sport. And so I guess the second half of the show, why don't we dive into a little bit of that? And so you mentioned that you work in finance, right? You work, you work with investments and you are also a PhD candidate while you're training. Um, and so before we, before we talk about all the other things that come along with that, for those that haven't joined us, just give us a little, a quick you know, background of, you know, your career that you have right now and how it's balancing with everything else. Oh, yeah, I'm, um, I'm working as, a, as an investment manager, portfolio manager in the fund uh, in the industry at Luxembourg Investment Solution, which is uh, part of the Sunday Group. And uh, beside that, I'm also a PhD a student in Shanghai University. So, like, uh, it's still on hold because of the, the corona crisis. So, we can't get access to uh, China uh, right now. And they said there's a window for defending online, but we are still waiting for uh, that. But so uh, currently I'm just working as an investment manager. 
Okay. And, and for you, I know you have a master's um, degree that has, you know, helped you get that far in your career, right? You have a master's, you're getting a PhD and you have experience in that field. But for most athletes that are watching who may not necessarily have these things to help them, how can you advise them to transfer the skills that they have as an athlete into a career? Um, Because I'm sure for you, there are certain things that you do on your job that, you know, have been, you've been able to do because of your experience as an athlete. So tell us some of those things and and how athletes can take from that and also transfer that into a career. I can say the first thing is uh, discipline. Like as an athlete, we have to be disciplined. This uh, discipline really, really help you at work. Like if you want to work like in the office or for a company, when you are disciplined, it will help you like in in in, in uh, everything because you know how to structure your uh, job, mm-hmm. know what to do. Then this, this power that you have on the track to win the uh, competition, to wake up every morning, go on training, and then like uh, to overcome all kind of obstacles. Which may which may come on your way, like this uh, this will that that we have in this discipline will help us like for the uh, career out of track and field. Right, right. I think I think that is a huge thing, discipline, and I think even bigger than that. I think for athletes, we as an athlete, you deal with every feeling that you could possibly experience you know as a human being that a lot of people don't get to experience so you know what it's like to succeed you know what it's like to have your dreams come true you know what it's like for your dreams to be completely taken away from you you know what it's like to lose you know like what it's like to win you know all those things right and it i mean for a lot of people who aren't athletes and and just you know just working they don't get to experience that that scope of life you know and so for athletes i think the fact that we have that you know experience in various things can translate very successful into a career and i think a lot of athletes don't necessarily know that so i'm glad that you you mentioned the discipline thing and even for you i mean you're balancing all these acts together right and you, earlier you said yeah. you work your full day and then at 6 p.m you go to the track or sometimes you wake up at 5 a.m to go to the gym and then <laughs> you go to the you go to the track later or whatever it is. And so tell us about a little bit more about the challenges of doing that. Because I think we all we all do that, but no one really talks about, you know, how difficult is that? How is your confidence? Mm-hmm. So, trust me, it's <laughs> very difficult. For example, I can just give an example. Like in 2018, I went to uh, Asaba for the African Championship where I did a relay with the uh, Ivorian team. And like because I had to ask at work this week to go to uh, compete, but before having this this week, I was training, mm-hmm. and then it's like you did that training, you go to work as, as a normal person. So when you do that training at five a.m., and then you go to work at eight, and then like your eyes, you need like a little cup of coffee like to you open your eye, and then like you go to the, to a meeting for example. People don't feel what you what 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 uh, you are you, you are feeling. You stand there and then you smile, but the inside is burning, you know. But you just keep it that you are an athlete. You know how to fight. You know how to survive. Because for us, we know how to win, how to lose. So you sit there like it's a struggle. I can't I can't I can't I can't lie to my brother and sisters saying that when you go from the sport career to like the career like uh, in the office something like that, it's gonna be easy. This transition, it's really hard. Because you know what kind of what type of discussion that we have when we are in the sport environment. It's nothing to do with uh, finance, nothing to do with uh, geography or something like that. So when you have to trust, when you have to do that the transition, you have to update yourself, go back a little bit to your books, and then study again. Then like have those habits that that uh, they have. You know, like how how to uh, behave, how to talk to uh, people. It's not it's like different kind of languages. You know. So all those kind of things. And to come back to that uh, example that, that, uh, that I was just saying in uh, uh, Asaba, I did that uh, competition and the day before, I had to check my email before the final of the relay, you know, last time, oh, I forgot this file. Oh no, I need to go back to that. So, you know, like you think about the competition, you think about the file that, 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 that you let the, and you feel like that the, the, the client might, might need it like the next day. So you need to do it, so okay, okay, just keep cool. No matter what, it's not gonna burn. Just do the competition. After that, you're gonna go back to work. 
And then it's like that, uh, you need like, this patient, you need to be patient and then you need to be like, it's not easy like to get that the wisdom and dissipation at the same time, yeah. Yes, I 100% agree with you. I think when you were saying the meeting, when you go from your training to the meeting, it's true, you, you have to completely turn on a different side of your brain or sometimes you go to the track and you're just tired because last night you were up working on something the whole time and then you have to show up at the track 100% ready to go. And then when you finish with the track and you go to work, you have to show up again 100% ready to go. And that constant switching back and forth is, it's very, very, it's very, very challenging. But I do like, I do like one thing that you said though, that, you know, for athletes in terms of the transition beyond the sport, we have to learn what that's like. We have to learn to do that. And I think a lot of athletes are waiting to finish the sport and then think that I finish the sport, then I want to start a career. And it doesn't happen that way. And it doesn't transition that easily. You know, you need to be, you need to at least have one foot, have one foot into a career that you want to do. And then another foot in the track world so that that way, you, while you're learning the skills that you need, there really yeah. isn't as much pressure to get it correct. When you finish the sport and you're ready to work a career, there's that pressure to know what you're doing. And I think in some cases, the fact that athletes are not spending the time with, you know, trying to figure out how to transition, it looks bad on athletes when we try to transition. Yeah. Because people think athletes are incapable of something, but it's not yeah. that. It's just you've spent the last 10, 15 of your years doing one particular thing, and now yeah. you have to learn something new, which most people were learning when they were... Ten years younger than you. That's right. That's what I was. I, I was just thinking. I was just thinking about it was like I was training in the Altis in the in the USA in the Phoenix uh, Altis with, with uh, the group because I was so used to doing two things at the same time, like running and then studying. You know. So when I got, I wanted to prepare the Olympics, like Rio Olympics, and then I was sitting there after after training. You know, for athlete, when you finish training, you go to sleep. And then you wake up and then you stay on internet your whole night, you know, or maybe or your whole day. It's like, that's what we do, you know. So, and then I was like, no, it does not working because I'm a French, I'm a native French speaker. So okay. I was like, what am I doing like right now when after after training? I cannot sleep like that. So I went to and run a community college to study English. Like to, because I was, pre I was preparing this uh, transition already while I was running, you know. Okay. As uh, uh, you said uh, correctly and uh, perfectly, we need to uh, prepare that. Mm -hmm. this is absolutely, absolutely. And we actually have a question that's coming in from a viewer. And the question is, how can we use alternative media, social media to reclaim the narrative, right? And I think this goes back to our earlier conversation that we're talking about. Uh, you know, for African athletes, we don't necessarily get the exposure that we are when we're doing great things. And part of that reason that we mentioned was because we don't control the narrative, right? So before I pass that, I pass that over to you, um, Willie, I wanted to say something in regards to that. I think that part of this is creating platforms like Beta Combo that Athletics Africa has done so that people can begin to see us as more and we can also get the story out. At the same time, I think that as Africans on the continent, we need to do a better job of supporting our athletes. We mm -hmm. need to do a better job of, you know, really getting invested into who these people are. Because I would say for myself, at least even, you know, competing for Ghana, I don't think anyone in terms of in the government position really knows who I am or really cares about what I'm doing outside of the sport. They don't until it becomes relevant enough, right? Um, and the only way I can become relevant is if I already have that support. Yeah. And so I think, you know, what we're doing here is a step into that. But Willie, I'm also in, um, curious what your thoughts are on that question. Yeah, for me, like, 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 uh, uh, as as you say, to go somewhere as you, we definitely need that support because in Africa we get plenty of time. Like the talent in Africa is huge, and then you see people running fast or maybe jumping that high. But you never see them because there is no, there is no commercial about it. There is no media about it. Nothing about it. There are so many because, like, they are living in some little places, and then with like really poor con condition, like running barefoot. And I start how my first competition was with the All Star Converse. I didn't have like a, like a spike. I, I didn't have spike, so nobody knew me. Like we start in the condition where you run 
in the dirt. Wow. I mean, in those kind of places, and there's no media. Like, they wait until you do something, like, incredible. Like, I'm just, like, like you came up with a miracle. Then all the cameras start to turn to you to say, like, this, this, this guy. But by the time you reach that side, maybe you have only one year of track and field. And that's mm -hmm. it. You know, one mm -hmm. track, that's it. For example, look at if I tell you at what you know at what age I start uh, track and field at 21 years old. Wow! I started at 21 years old. Wow. My first competition was directly in Nigeria for the uh, what we call the world, uh, the the, the wow. West African uh, uh, competition for the uh, polytechnic in mm. uh, West Africa. So that was my first competition, running with All Star in the dirt. And then you get in the plane, and just go straight to run in, a, in, a, in a, uh, Nigeria. That's how it is. So they could see my my talent at 22 years old. You know, the guy they know even how to drill. Right. Right. Of, we need. We need. We need. We need. We need. We need those. Media, we need those. You know, we need those people too, as you do with better people to talk more about uh, Africa, talk more mm -hmm. about talent to come on and then to shine. Yeah. Right, exactly. And I think and I think I've mentioned this multiple times, but I think, you know, before we close out, I'm just going to close with this. I think that it's an investment and people don't realize that sports is currency. The reason why um, the U.S. has a huge economy based around sports is because there's that recognition of the value add that athletes have. Right. Sports is the only thing that can touch on every aspect of culture because of what it does. You can, sport, sports is related to food. Sports can influence, you know, uh, uh, emotions. Sports can influence business. Help. It can influence the economy. And, and the Western world has figured that out, right? And so that's why a lot of money is thrown at uh, LeBron James, but LeBron James brings so much money back, <laughs> you know? And, and that investment in that, like we can't, in Africa, we cannot have a Usain Bolt. We cannot have any of those, big names until we stop and invest into that. And the day you invest is not the day you get the return, right? Mm -hmm. And that's what Africans need to see. The day you invest is not the day you get the return. And so my message that I continue to preach is that we have to invest at a grassroots level. We have mm -hmm. to put in the time and the money to make sure that our athletes are getting on the stage. And then 20 years from now, we can talk about how great our athletes are because we have invested into that. Yes, you know, yes. you reap what you haven't sown. And Africans yes. with sports try to reap something we haven't sown. And so hopefully this type of conversation, this platform really begins to move the needle in that way and really starts to get you know, us as a continent to start thinking differently about our athletes. Um, but before we do close out though, I do have one question. I always have a wild card that I ask everyone that comes on the show. And my question for you is, is there a talent, a hidden talent that you have that nobody knows about that we would like the world to know? A talent except <laughs> a sport, like out of a sport, right? Yeah, out of sport. A sport is like, um, I have this talent of gathering people, you know? Okay. Of being like entrepreneur, gathering people. That's why, for example, now I'm the uh, uh, pres president of the uh, National Olympic Association in my uh, country. And then I, I already start like I, I've uh, already started to work for the athletes. You know what I mean? Like to gather all them together and then to do something. For, for example, for this uh, association is to promote the uh, Olympics in Ivory because like to show that. I think we can bring something positive to the uh, society. Do you, okay. know, do you know what I mean? It's like, it's like, because when you do the Olympics in Africa, when you finish the Olympics, after after the next day after the Olympics, they don't know you. Yeah. They don't know when you go, unless you uh, get the medal. So those people who sacrifice those four years need to be like, we need to be all, all together to bring that experience to our younger brother, to teach them like, to fall in the same trap where we, uh, well in, in the past, but just to help them by coaching them, by doing those uh, mentorship. And uh, so that's uh, what I'm doing. That's what's called cool. well, Thank you so much for your time. It's really, really been a pleasure to have you here with us, Willie. Um, you shared a lot of stuff and I'm sure we could benefit from having this bigger conversation about contracts um, in the future. 
But before we do end the session, I would like to give a special shout out to Fabrice Sango for his indoor world record in the triple jump. Um, I am a triple jumper and an African triple jumper at that. And so this really brings, you know, joy to my heart to see that. And congratulations, Fabrice. We're always supporting you. We're always rooting for you. Um, and so as we're heading out, I just want to say thank you all for being here. Thank you for tuning in. And if you enjoy the conversation, please feel free to continue in the chat below. Otherwise, you know where to find me next week. We'll be here same time. Have a lovely rest of your week and we'll see you soon. Thank you.